Um, this week we are uh, very um, pleased to have our own um, Professor Panengaden uh, give the first guest lecture of the semester. Um, Professor Panengaden has a, a, a large set of unique work um, spanning physics, um, uh, programming languages, and um, more recently, um, uh, machine learning. And um, we're, uh, we're looking forward to hearing what, um, what, what he has to say this week. Um, so uh, please give a very warm welcome to uh, Prakash Panangan. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I see Umar is just about to join. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm not sure what is the background of people here. Um, so this is work that I began in 2015. So as it happened then, I was invited to speak at a winter school about uh, um, probabilistic bi-simulation, logical characterization, metrics between probability distributions. So this last topic is something that interests the machine learning community. And at, also at that uh, winter school was somebody talking about equational logic and programming languages and how to reason about programs using equations. And so we kind of uh, joined forces and came up with this topic, which is quantitative equational reasoning. So I'm not going to assume that everybody knows equational reasoning. I mean, in some sense, everybody does know equational reasoning. Everybody has manipulated equations, but to know the formal theory of equational reasoning is something else. But so I will actually spend quite a lot of time reviewing that before I get on to quantitative equational reasoning. Normally, I present this to a community of logicians or people in programming language semantics. So it's a very different uh, group and with different background than what we have at Mila. So uh, feel free to interrupt me. I assume from the size of the audience, this can be completely informal. You can interrupt me, you can unmute yourself and uh, just ask me questions. So fundamentally, equations are at the heart of mathematical reasoning. I believe that the equality sign, the two parallel lines, is the oldest symbol still used from its original form in mathematics. It's rumored to be 1500 years old. So <clears throat> if you think about programming languages, it, reasoning about programs is also based on program equivalences. So when I talk about reasoning about programs, I mean things like proving that a certain program has certain properties, for example, that it terminates or that it behaves in a certain way or that it computes a certain function and so on. So this kind of subject has a rich mathematical theory behind it called programming language semantics. And it has many logical formalisms for reasoning about the properties of programs. And many of these pro uh, logics are based on the notion of when are two programs equivalent. It was actually investigating such things that led me to the study of bi-simulation and Markov processes. I started out by studying the equivalence of probabilistic programs. So to uh, plagiarize uh, a title popularized by David Mumford, I would like to call this the dawning of the age of quantitative reasoning. So one has moved beyond mere equivalence to a quantitative notion of distance. And this is what quantitative equational logic is about. So we want the quantitative analog of algebra, basically. And that's what I'm going to present. So, we, uh, so in order to do that, of course, I should explain in some general sense what algebra means. So I see Guillaume has just joined us. Um, <laughs> hi, Guillaume. Uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, summarizing what I'm going to talk about today. The crucial change that happens when you go from standard equational reasoning to quantitative equational reasoning is that you move from the concept of equivalence relation to the notion of metrics, or to be more precise, what I call 
pseudometrics. Uh, so pseudometrics are in some sense exactly the quantitative analog of the notion of equivalence relation. And if you'd like to think in terms of what the relevant notation is, you can think that what we're going to do is introduce a notion of equality, but now indexed by a real number epsilon. So I'm going to say S equals sub epsilon T, meaning not that S and T are equal, but S and T are within epsilon of each other. Now, okay, you might think, yeah, that's, that's a, you know, a hack that you can introduce to uh, talk about equational reasoning. But in fact, perhaps a bit to my surprise, there turned out to be a systematic theory that wasn't just a hack. So let me tell you the basic idea. So we, as I said before, we'll write things like this, S equals sub epsilon T, and we will intuitively think of it as S is within epsilon of T by whatever notion of within you have in mind. So this is absolutely not an equivalence relation because if S is within epsilon of T, and T is within epsilon of U, there's no reason why S should be within epsilon of U, more likely S is within two epsilon of U, or maybe a bit less, but definitely you cannot think of this as an equivalence relation. And this breaks a lot of our intuitions because thinking equationally means thinking about equivalence relations. We take, the tran take uh, transitivity absolutely as one of the sacred things when we reason about equationally. It actually defines a different kind of mathematical structure called a uniformity. Now, this is a wonderful thing which I have not talked about very much, and I won't stress this point of view today, but let me just say for those who are interested in it, so there's a subject called uh, metric spaces and there's a subject called topology. And topology is all about notions of convergence and continuity and so on. Metric spaces talk actually about numerical values of distances and with the notion of metric, you can talk about a space being complete. In the topological world, it doesn't make sense because essentially what complete means is that sequences that should converge actually do converge. And this part of what do you mean by they should converge? Well, that's a numerical criterion called the Cauchy convergence criterion. And so in the metric world, you can state that. In the topological world, you can't even state it. Uniformities are somewhere in between that. They allow you to talk about completeness without introducing a numerical notion of distance. So there's more information than a topology, but less information than a metric. And sometimes I maybe in those dark nights when <laughs> I'm not sure where the universe is going, I sometimes think that we should really stress the uniformity point of view more than we have done so far in mathematics. But let me uh, not babble about what I think about the dark hours of the night. Uh, so what I think about really uh, the basic idea here is quantitative analog of equational reasoning. So equational reasoning is not just fiddling with equations. There's actually a wonderful rich subject mostly developed in the 1930s and mostly by a single person, but several others also, but the name most associated with equational reasoning is Garrett Berkhoff. And he proved very, very fundamentally two fun, uh, theorems. One is the completeness theorem, which basically says, if uh, a, a property of a whole class of algebraic structures will hold if and only if you can prove it from the axioms. So this is very, very important. Uh, he also introduced the notion of a free algebra and their universal property. So those of you who've studied some algebra will be familiar with free group, free monoid, but these are all instances of, of a general thing called a free algebra. And he gave the general definition. But he also proved a really, really great theorem called the variety theorem, which I'll tell you about a bit in a bit. And from the more categorical point of view, so this of course was not done by Burkhoff, but much later, one realized that one way of looking at this subject uh, was through a kind of functor called a monad. And monads actually became important in programming languages. And, and in fact, uh, it got incorporated into the programming language Haskell as a programming feature. And so many, many, probably 90% of the people who use this word think that monads were invented by the language Haskell. <laughs> it was really the other way around. <clears throat> okay, so now to serious business. Uh, so let's introduce ordinary non-quantitative 
universal algebra. That's what the subject was called, universal algebra, the kind of meta theory of what algebra should be about. So first of all, we have what's called a signature. And what does a signature consist of? It consists of a bunch of operators. Each operator has associated with it a numerical arity. This simply tells you how many arguments it takes. So a familiar example is the signature of the integers. It has two operations, plus and times. Actually, it has four operations because it has a zero and a one, which you can think of operators with zero arguments. Okay, so the arity of plus is two because it takes two arguments and produces a thing in, in your structure. Multiplication is another binary operator. So these are the two binary operators. Other theories may have ternary operators. And later on, when things got fancier, people realized that you could have infinitary operators. And it turns out that certain things that don't look like algebra are actually the algebraic theory of operations with infinity, infinitary operations. And a classic example of this is the theory of compact house door spaces, which one tends to think, hey, that's topology. It turns out this is algebra <laughs> with a certain infinitary operation about limits. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Once you've introduced this signature, so this is so far only notation. I'm just saying there are these things called operators and I'm including operators of arity zero to stand for the constants. So I'm viewing constants as special cases of operators. Once you have operators, you can now build what are called terms. So terms are basically complex names for the things in your algebraic theory. So a term can contain variables and given a bunch of variables and the constants and the operators, you inductively build up these terms. So for example, once I tell you zero and one are constants and plus and times are operators and you say, okay, one plus one is a new term. One plus zero is a new term. Zero times zero is a term. And then I say, hey, you can have variables too. And then you say, oh, cool. X plus Y plus zero is a term. <laughs> X times Y plus and so on. So usually uh, if you just have zero and one, you can't do a lot of arithmetic. <laughs> so we often introduce something called the successor function, which is a unary function. So then you say, oh, you have successor of zero and successor of one, so, sorry, successor of successor of zero and so on. And usually we give these things shorter names like one, two, three, and so forth. And so you can build up an interesting set of terms, but we haven't said anything about these terms yet. They're just there, we've been able to name things. Now we start saying non-trivial things and we say these things by introducing equations. So the intuition behind equations is clear, but I need to formalize what they mean. So we're going to introduce things called axioms and these are essentially sets of equations. Now, not all axioms take the form of equations. And when the axioms are pure equations, we call it an equational theory. And so not everything is an equational theory, some things are described by equations, some are not. But what do you do with these equations? You deduce things, starting from your axioms, which are given as equations, you can do certain uh, transformations and deduce new equations. And this whole notion of deduction, this is what logic is about. So we have the usual rules for deductions, namely, for example, the rules of an equivalence relation, the rules of a congruence. So congruence says if X equals Y and U equals V and F is an operator, then F of X, Y equals F of U, V. So you can, it's not just that uh, equality is preserved, but equality is preserved by the operations. And finally, we have a concept of theory. So I give you a bunch of axioms and I say, what are all the consequences from our rules of deduction? And you'll get some big infinite set. That big infinite set is called a theory, the set of all the equations that you can get by carrying out deductions. Now we want to talk about algebras. This stuff that I've talked about so far is still just notation in some sense. We need to interpret these things. And the, we interpret these things in algebra. That's what algebra is about, the interpretation of these sets of equations and operations. So I'm going to look at special kinds of algebras called one-sorted algebras. 
these are the algebras you're familiar with. But a simple example of something that's not one sorted is vector spaces, where we have vectors and scalars. But usually, if you look at things like groups, rings, fields, these are all, there's one kind of thing there. Okay, so we call them one sorted algebras. And for simplicity, I will mostly stick to one sorted algebras. Occasionally, I'll mention vector spaces. So we have the signature associated with the algebra, as I described before, a set of operations, each with a fixed finite arity, and I'm going to insist finiteness on the arities now. So given the signature omega, I'm going to say an omega algebra is basically just a set, A, and to interpret and an interpretation of all the operations. And what I mean by interpretation is that for each symbol, so in the signature F is just a symbol, it doesn't mean anything yet. But when I talk about an algebra, I say now I'm interpreting it and the interpretation is some bona fide function from n tuples of A to A. So it says, if the arity is n, give me n things from A, I will do something to them and produce a thing in A. So, Given this notion, uh, general notion of algebra, so this is what the subject called universal algebra was all about. What can we say without looking at specific examples of algebras? We can define some standard concepts, homomorphism, maps between algebras that preserve all the operations and constants, subalgebras, a subset of the al algebra that you're looking at, but which is already closed under the operation. So these are very standard concepts. And now you want to say, oh, there's some axioms that hold. And what these axioms are, are certain equations. What are these equations? How do we specify what they are? So given a set X, we define the term algebra generated by X. I'll call this T, sub, T of X. So the, all the elements of X are in T of X. And then I'll define it by induction. If I say I have a family of things in T of X, and F has arity N, then F applied to all those things is also in T of X. So I can build up more and more things. So I've just introduced a bunch of random things in my set X and I say, these are like new constants. And now I'm going to build up terms based on these new things. And now we want to write down equations. So these new things, you can think of them as variables that I've added. So I want to write down equations like, for example, this one, I just like to say F, which is a binary thing applied to X, and the second argument is F applied to YZ is the same as this one. This you see, recognize this as a familiar thing called associativity. And I'd like to say, I won't write equations like this. I have to explain what does this kind of thing mean? So now we say this X, we think of it as variables. And now I'm going to tell you, supposing S and T are two terms constructed from operations, constants, and variables, I'm going to say this equation holds if for every homomorphism from T of X to A, if I look at the image of S and the image of T, then I get the same element in A. If that always happens, then I'll say this equation, S equals T, it actually holds in the algebra A, okay? So it says, doesn't matter how you interpret the variables, wh whatever you do, then you apply all the operations, then you see what you get, you must get the two instances of the same thing. If that happens, then the equation holds. If it doesn't happen, the equation doesn't hold. So supposing we have a set of equations between pairs of terms in T of X. So notice one thing that's happening. I've described algebras, but then just the raw terms themselves itself is an example of an algebra, right? Because I have the operation automatically defined just by the inductive thing of saying, put the F around the subterms. So the, this collection T of X itself is an example of the algebra. That's why I can talk about homomorphisms from T of X to A. Now, supposing I have a set of equations, I'm going to define a congruence relation in the obvious way. So what do I mean by the obvious way? I'll say, I've got this equation, so I've got already some terms that I know are equal, and then if I apply f to a bunch of equal terms and f to the to another set of terms that are equal to the first set, those two things are equal. So I build up inductively a bigger set of equations, and ultimately I get a congruence relation.
once you have a congruence relation, you can quotient your set of terms by this congruence relation. And actually what you will get uh, is that these operators are actually restrict sensibly to the quotient structure. Okay, so act this operation is well-defined because what you do is you say, you apply F to these representative terms and then take the equivalence class of this congruence for that thing. This defines an interpretation on the quotient in space. And that's a well-defined instance of this algebra. Okay, so I've shown you how to build one algebra from the terms, but there could be many. If I look at all the omega algebras setting, satisfying a set of equations, we get something called a variety. So this is a terrible clash of terminology because there's also something in algebraic geometry called an algebraic variety. And that's a totally unrelated thing. So this is called a variety of algebras. To add to the confusion in French, the word variété is used for smooth manifold, but never mind. Uh, <laughs> here, I, when I say variety, I mean a family of algebras satisfying a bunch of equations. So can I write down any old equation that pops into my head and say, yeah, here's a variety? Well, you can, but sometimes you might do stupid things. So what's an example of a stupid thing? In fact, what is, what is the example of a stupid thing? If you derive the equation x equals y, where x and y are just variables, that means, hey, I just got these two completely unrelated variables and one of my equations says x equals y. So that means any substitution instance has to hold. So that means any two terms are equal. That means in any algebra, any two elements are equal. In short, I only have one element algebras. So this means the whole theory has degenerated. And so this is an example of a bad equation or an inconsistent set of equations. So what are examples of these varieties? Monoids, okay? Uh, I assume everybody's familiar with monoids. Uh, groups, rings, lattices. And by the way, I don't mean the number theorist lattices, but I mean the uh, algebraic lattices, which are uh, sets equipped with two binary operations, which you can think of as like meet and join. Boolean algebras, which are lattices, which in addition have a notion of negation. All these things are examples of varieties. All the defining equations are bona fide equations. What have I left out of this list? So there's vector spaces. I didn't include it at first because vector spaces have two kinds of things, scalars and vectors. But apart from that small detail, it's essentially another equational variety. But fields are very annoying and they don't fit this pattern. And why not? Because fields have an operation called inverse, multiplicative inverse, but not everything. So you have to say, if X is not zero, then X inverse exists. And then you have the equations for multiplicative inverse. So this is not an equation, it's a conditional equation. And this actually ruins the theory. Fields do not fit this pattern and they break many theorems. Do you have a question, Guillaume? Yeah, I was just thinking if you extend the real with the infinities, like the extended reals, do, do you get something? Can you define this field as a, in an equational way? Because you solve kind of this problem, no? By saying x inverse equals infinity? Yeah, no, does that work? I, <laughs> <It's very> naive, but <laughs> interesting idea, but I'll actually tell you in some very fundamental way that, that fields are broken. Okay. And are not cheaply fixed. So, so I haven't thought about what you said but I'm almost sure that it actually won't work. Okay. Unless you make it so different that it becomes unrecognizable <laughs> from the traditional fields. But, uh, but I have to tell you why. Sometimes we need to state conditional equations. Uh, and so one example is called cancellative monoids. So here you say, oh, if x dot y equals x dot z, then y equals z. This is not an equation. This is a conditional equation. And you know this holds in the monoid of strings that computer scientists are so familiar with. So we have, this is a cancellative monoid, right? If x, y, and z are strings and, and the dot is string concatenation, that's certainly a correct conditional equation. But you notice this is not a group. It doesn't have inverse. 
which is something I'm trying to drill into my undergraduate students because I keep explaining to them that when I write A to the N, I mean the string of A repeated N times and they keep putting their hands up and say, can N be a negative integer? And I can, no. <laughs> All well, right. Prakash, yeah. um, could, you, could you include um, topological spaces in this if you just dealt with the collection of open sets? Like, would that fit within this framework of universal algebra? Uh, yeah, so he, he, yes, let me answer that question in some detail. So okay, it depends on the point of view you're taking. If you say, ah, I want to study the points of a topological space and talk about convergence of sequences of points and things, then no. But if you say, you just said, take the view of open sets. You just say, I'm just looking at the open sets. I don't remember anything about points. You just give me this collection of open sets then indeed you get a top, uh, an algebra, it's called a Heiting algebra. Ah, okay, thanks. And if you take the regular open sets, you get a Boolean algebra, but, and there's a, anyway, no, no. I, I'm about to talk about stone duality, so I'm stopping myself before I get carried For another on. talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want to talk about a very, very interesting algebra that will become, uh, uh, important later on in this talk. So here you see, in my signature, I'm going to introduce uncountably many binary operations. Wow. <laughs> so each operation is still binary, but there are uncountably many of them. So for every real number between 0 and 1, I have an operating, operation called plus sub epsilon. So secretly, this is going to be convex combinations. But right now, it's just a piece of syntax. And then by golly, I throw a bunch of equations at you. So let's look at these, these equations. It says t plus sub one t prime equals t. And so the way you should think about x plus sub epsilon y is you take epsilon of x and one minus epsilon of y and make the convex combination. Okay, now of course, you're thinking of maybe some concrete vector space and so on where this can be sensibly interpreted, but I'm just saying this is notation and I'm writing down equations because I want to give you the idea that you introduce these operations and axiom for them. And after that, you look for structures that satisfy the, these equations. So these uh, things were called barycentric algebras. They were introduced by Marshall Stone in 1949. And he wanted to initiate the abstract study of the notion of convexity. And indeed, the algebras you get from this are very, very interesting. They're called convex algebras. And of course, the usual convex spaces that we're familiar with are examples of convex algebras. <clears throat> so this axiom now makes perfect sense. It says if you take one of t and zero of t prime and mix them, well, of course, you're going to get t. And if you take a mixture of t and itself in any ratio, then of course, it's just going to be t. Uh, and if you take a mixture of T and T prime, it's the same as taking a mixture of T prime and T, but with the ratios adjusted. So what the epsilon gets changed to a one minus epsilon. So this is not quite commutativity. And this name SC stands for skew commutativity. So it's commutativity with a twist. And this guy is skew associativity because you say, okay, I can group it in the other way, but now I have to do some gymnastics with the numbers so that they all match up. And there's some small probability that I've actually written the correct formulas here. But even if I haven't, the way you figure it out is you draw the two trees and you just make sure that things balance correctly. I did it once, but when I do calculations like this, very error prone. But anyway, this is an example of what I mean by I wrote down an equational algebra. So of course, groups, rings, fields, and all you're familiar with, but this one you're perhaps not familiar with. But now that I've told you the operations and the equations, you understand it perfectly. What you're dying to know, of course, is examples. And you can cook up your own examples because you've seen these examples before. Sets of probability distributions, for example, satisfy these axioms. <clears throat> okay, so now I want to talk about a very, very important concept called a universal property. So I'll use this horrible notation K of omega comma S. It's the collection of algebras satisfying the equations in S and having the signature omega, okay? And you can organize this into a category if you take the morphisms to be the homomorphisms, the ones that preserve the operations of omega. 
So supposing you give me a random set X, we can construct T of X. And what I mean by this T of square brackets X is you construct the terms freely by induction by adding X as if they were new constants. And then you quotient by the equations, by the congruence induced by the equations of S. And then you'll get a canonical map from X to T of X. And what this thing says is you take a little element X and map it to the equivalence class of little X in T of X. This has a very, very interesting property called the universal property. And it works like this. Supposing I take any algebra whatsoever in this family of algebras, I take any algebra script A, I forget about the algebra structure and only remember the set. There's some set A. I take any map whatsoever alpha from X to A. Now X and A are just set. So we've forgotten anything about algebra. And I've said, take any map you want, call it alpha. Remember there's also this map from X to T of X, which is called the inclusion of generators. The theorem, the universal property says, given any alpha like that, there exists a unique homomorphism, not just a function, homomorphism going from T of X to A in such a way that if you follow the generators and then follow H, it'll actually match what alpha told you. The uniqueness says that once I've specified what happens to the generators, everything else is fixed. That's the universal property. So one sense of the universality is you can do anything you want on X. And the second part of the universality is once you've done that, you've, you have no more freedom left. The algebra forces everything else. Not any old algebra has this property. So just to give you an example, what's the universal algebra for our signature of integers. So I, I, my signature says there's a thing called zero. There's a thing called the successor function. Let's forget about plus and times. Let's think about zero and successor. And we, then we will say, hmm, the integers, that the, the natural numbers that you know, that's actually universal. Because once you specify where zero goes and you insist on the successor being a homomorphism, you have no choice. The whole thing is forced upon you. Okay, now we come to Birkhoff's amazing variety theorem. A collection of algebras is a variety of algebras, i.e. specified by equations, if and only if it is closed under homomorphic images, subalgebras, and products. So let me repeat what this says. You have this whole family of algebras. Let's look at something we are familiar with, like groups. So if I take a group and I have a homomorphism to another group and I just look at the image, well, that image has to be a group also. If I take a group and I look at a subgroup, well, that subgroup also has to be in my collection of groups. If I take two groups and I form the product, or indeed, if I take an infinite collection of groups and I form the pointwise product, I should be able to give a group structure to that product. Okay, so his theorem says, if you are specific given by equations, then all these things are going to be true. And conversely, if all these things are true, then you must be given by equations. And if you look at more general things like horn clauses, then there are other theorems called quasi variety theorems that I don't want to go into. So this is what I, I would say the grand theorem of universal algebra from the 1930s. Now let's consider fields. Consider the field Z2. So Z2 has just two elements, zero, one, with, the, you know, it's basically arithmetic mod two. It's a field. Now you look at this uh, thing, one, zero cross zero, one. I try to construct Z2 cross Z2. One, zero is not the zero element. Zero, one is not the zero element. But when I multiply them, I get zero, zero, because the multiplication is a pointwise operation. Zero, zero is zero. Now this is not a field. Why? Because one of the basic things about fields is that they don't have zero divisors. So whatever this Z2 cross Z2 thing is, it's not a field, not closed under product. Elementary trivial observation, but now Birkhoff's hammer comes in and says, in that case, forget about it. Nothing you can do with equations is going to ever axiomatize the theory of fields. Okay, so this is 
you know, there's a theorem with real consequences. Okay, I've spent more than half the time talking about ordinary equations. I want to very quickly talk about quantitative equations and I'll probably do this faster and you'll say, wait a minute, I didn't, uh, I'm not trying to tell you proofs. I just want to try to tell you ideas. Um, so we have the notion of signature as before, but now we want to introduce quantitative equations. And what we're going, so there are two variations. In fact, there are several variations. I could insist that these uh, epsilons are bounded in the range zero, one or not. And they're both versions of the theory have been worked out and both make sense. Now, a substitution is simply a map that says for each variable, I'll substitute some term. Okay, and I'm going to write sigma of X for the collection of all such substitutions. Any such map extends to a map from the whole set of terms to terms. And now I'm going to talk about what's called a quantitative inference. So in a quantitative inference, we have a bunch of hypotheses on the left-hand side of this symbol, which is called a turnstile. It looks like this, which is like the turnstile of a field or the turnstile of a place where you have to get into when you're using a ticket like the Metro. So this symbol is used for logical deduction. On the left-hand side are your assumptions. On the right-hand side is what you conclude. So here the idea is I've made a bunch of assumptions which are all in the form of these quantitative equations and I deduce some quantitative equation. We'll call these things quantitative inferences and for now I'm going to insist on finitely many things on the right. And now we come to the heart of the matter. How do you do deduction in this world? So notice ordinary equations are going to be captured by writing a zero as my epsilon. But then I'm going to allow the looser things with non-zero epsilons as well. So symmetry, if T is within epsilon of S, then S is within epsilon of T. And now something like a triangle, not something like the triangle inequality. <laughs> if T is within epsilon of S and S is within epsilon prime of U, then T is within epsilon plus epsilon prime of U. So we have, this is what tells you it's not an equivalence relation, but it has some structure. It's not just, hey, it's not an equivalence. It's, it's got some property. The interpretation of this epsilon is that, by the way, you're at most epsilon apart, not that you're exactly epsilon apart. So if you're within epsilon, you're also within a bigger epsilon. So if I add a little epsilon prime, that equation is also automatically valid because it's basically a looser statement. Okay, so, right? <clears throat> and here is the important infinitary continuity rule. So it says, if you've got a whole bunch of epsilons converging, epsilon primes converging to some epsilon, and you're able to prove that T is within epsilon prime for any of those epsilon primes, then it's within epsilon. Okay, so this is kind of reasoning is continuous kind of property in this world. And this is crucial. Without it, lots of things break up. And what I actually like about this is this kind of coming together of analysis and logic in this subject, because it's not pure logic. It's not traditional analysis either. We have a very important condition, which many people have bitterly complained about called non-expansiveness. And so it says, if I have a family of pairs of terms all within epsilon, you see T1 is within epsilon of S1, all the way up to Tn is within epsilon of Sn. And then I have two function symbols and I apply F to those, both those corresponding families, then those are at most epsilon. So that means applying an operation can't push things apart. It might bring them closer together, but it's not going to push them apart. Very important. And it's kind of the analog of the congruence property for equations. It means you can compose things. You can build structures up and your equations will not get worse and worse. We have a substitution property, which says, if you've got an equation like that, then every substitution instance also holds. If for every, so supposing from this assumptions gamma, I can deduce phi for every phi in some set gamma prime. And then from gamma prime, I can deduce psi 
then from gamma I can deduce i. So this is chaining together deductions. This is called the cut rule. And if phi, one of your quantitative equations is in the set of assumptions, then surely you can deduce it. Okay, so that's, that's the whole, the important part, the how do you do deduction in this quantitative world? And now okay. we have quantitative equational theories coming out of it. Oh, can, can I ask a quick question about that, about the last sure. slide? Yeah. Um, so it, it seems like all of these are properties that uh, are sort of desirable to have this um, sort of parameterized equality uh, satisfy, but are these things that you're necessarily going to assume all of these in the following? Like yes. in, in particular, the non-expansive property, I could easily imagine settings where, uh, you know, some of the functions f don't satisfy that. So yes. this is just something that whatever theories we're describing in, in the following all are something that has to satisfy yes. and all of these axioms. As I said, people uh, universally complain about this particular one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair, fair. But it, if, uh, if it's useful, then that makes sense. It makes the theory hang together in a coherent way. Uh, there are weakenings. So we have versions in which we say, you only have to be <clears throat> non-expansive in each argument separately and not collectively, which allows you to do a lot more things, but then the theory gets more and more complicated. And then there are versions in which you can say, okay, let's not restrict to non-expansiveness, but let's fix some Lipschitz constant. And we've, we've also done things like that, but makes the theory messier and messier. And, okay. and this is the usual tension in mathematics, right? You might say, oh, I want this, yeah. I want that, I want that. And then you say, yeah, starting to get messy now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, that makes so sense. Indeed, there, there are very sensible things that are ruled out. And we're very sad. We, we, we cry every morning about not being able to do them, but, <laughs> but it's a fact. So, some things are ruled out. Okay, thanks. It is cut in this logic um, necessary? Yes. I, I don't know what you mean by necessary. Uh, we've put it in as a fundamental defining feature of deducibility. <laughs> and I've seen very few logics that don't have a cut like that. Um, yeah. Cut means you're really screwed, right? You can't chain together deductions. And sometimes there's a there's an elimination theorem. I'm not. No, 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 no. That's a different sure. thing, Constantine. It's, you know, <laughs> cut elimination says you don't need to use cut, but to take out cut as a fundamental rule is a disaster. Mm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So it is a fact that many or, or, or many well-defined logics say. I have a meta theorem that says anytime you did a proof in which you used cut, it's possible to rearrange the proof and not, not use cut. So um, if I remember correctly, I think even this logic has that property. But ask any person to actually do proofs, <laughs> I guarantee they will be using cuts. <clears throat> okay. So cut, cut elimination is something you often do when you're trying to write down automated theorem provers and you want to do proof search and you want to be able to do proof search without the possibility of cut. Cut usually kills proof search, right? Because who knows what you cut in. Right. Quantitative equational theories. So given a set of equations, you look for the smallest deducibility relation containing your given equations and satisfying all the conditions on the previous slide. So that now defines a theory. And so the equational part is when you kind of say, let's keep the proper equations out of all the things that we deduced. So let's talk about quantitative algebras. And the basic bottom line here is that it's a good old fashioned algebra as we had before, plus a metric structure. So it's an algebra with a metric space. That's basically it. This is what we have axiomatized. All the functions in omega are non-expansive in the sense of this metric structure. And the morphisms between omega, uh, these kinds of algebras are omega algebra homomorphisms in the traditional sense, plus the non-expansiveness condition. So there's a kind of a metric aspect and a traditional algebra aspect merged to, together into these things. 
So Tx is just an omega algebra. It doesn't yet have metric structure. Uh, and given any A, you can define a homomorphism like that. So what does it mean to say that one of these quantitative algebras satisfies an equation? So before we said all the substitution instances must correspond to actual identities in the algebra when you interpret them. When you, when you interpret the variables in your terms as elements in the algebra, then compute what do these terms stand for? The two things on either side of the equality symbol must denote the same thing in the algebra. Then we'll say, aha, the equation holds in this algebra. So we want an analogous thing. And roughly speaking, we're going to say, if all the substitution instances satisfy these inequalities, so you see how we are interpreting them as inequalities, they're bounds on how far apart they can be, then the interpretation of the terms S and T must also satisfy the inequality less than epsilon. So it's exactly as before, except that it's now in terms of this metric structure and satisfying this distance constraint. And we'll say, this equation holds in the algebra, so we'll make a double turnstile subscripted by the name of the algebra. That means this algebra A satisfies the equation that I've just written. And so now we can write something like this uh, for the family of algebras satisfying a bunch of equations, just as we had before with Ks. And we can introduce a metric structure on the terms now. And what we do is we'll say, look for all the equations you can somehow prove starting from your theory between S and T and take the inf over all those things. That will define a distance function between the terms S and T. So you might say, why, why did you insist on having uh, equations with no assumptions? So we could have said, hey, well, take any equation that you can derive from the theory with some set, possibly with some set of assumptions Turns out that they are the same. Ha. So, so it didn't matter which one we did. In fact, there was a ferocious debate between me and my co-author about which was the right one until we proved they were actually the same. So then we stopped fighting. Uh, <clears throat> now, this way of defining it allows pseudometrics that can actually take on infinite values. It's a pseudometric, so that means there could be terms that are at zero distance. And if you look at the kernel of that pseudometric, you will get a congruence for the uh, operations. And if you take the quotient, you actually get a bona fide metric space, not a pseudometric space. And the resulting algebra that you get is one of the algebras in our class of algebras. And in fact, you can take any set of generators and produce a free quantitative algebra in the sense. So just like you did free algebras in the old world, you can do it here, but you can do something actually even better. So we proved a completeness theorem, namely if one of these quantitative equation holds for every algebra in a certain class of algebras, that's possible if and only if it's actually provable from the equations. So if it's always true in every algebra, then you should be able to prove it. And if, it, and if you can prove it, it's certainly true in all the algebras. Because this reverse direction from right to left is what's called soundness. And if that were not true, that would mean your equational system is just broken <laughs> and can't do proper reasoning. But the forward direction from left to right says, if it's true in all the algebras, you will be able to prove it. So that's a completeness theorem. And it's the analog of the completeness theorem as uh, Birkhoff did it, so, but the construct, we have to do a model construction, but we have to deal with all the quantitative aspects and it uses the infinitary axiom in a crucial way. So somehow the continuity is crucial for this proof to go through. There's actually a finitary version, which uh, I won't tell you about. Now, remember I said, you can start with any set and construct the free algebra and give it a metric structure, but actually you can start from a metric space and construct the free algebra built on top of that metric space. And what you do is you add additional axioms for every pair of elements in the metric space and you somehow encode the distance information as additional axioms and then you build the free algebra. So I'll skip all these details but just um, to tell you, it has the same 
kind of universal property, except that instead of these functions being in set, there are non-expansive functions between metric spaces, and this guy has to be an isometry. But the same theorem holds. You take one of these algebras, you forget everything except the metric structure, you take an arbitrary non-expansive map, there'll be a unique homomorphism that will be also non-expansive that will commute with the inclusion of generators. So again, this kind of universal property, and for those of you who know a bit of category theory, we define monads in this way, but in the category of metric spaces. Okay, a lot of abstract theory shit. Let us do something concrete because you know abstract theory puts people to sleep and concrete theory, concrete examples tend to make you wake up again. And this is, uh, if I may say, the thing that convinced me that I wasn't just doing some boring crap. It convinced me that we have an interesting topic here. So let's go back to our barycentric algebras, uncountably many operations, et cetera, that I described before. Here are the axioms, but now you see I've written equal sub zero everywhere, because those, those were the equations that uh, Marshall Stone had written down, but now I'm going to add equations to this. And the equations I add will be quantitative equations. So look at this crazy equation. So x plus sub e z equals sub epsilon y plus a e z for any e less than epsilon. Okay, so what's the commonality here? There's a z on both sides. So I call this the left invariant equation. And you know, uh, a lot of people think that mathematicians sit around and randomly make up sets of axioms and try to explore them, but this is not true. The axioms you make up capture some intuition in your head. But I'm going to present this like that. Hey, I randomly made up this equation. <laughs> what does it describe? Okay. So just note this new equation uses the new, these indexed equalities in a non-trivial way. All the others were just the old fashioned equation. All right, so we call it the left invariant axiom scheme or lib algebras. And here's the question, what, what the heck are you describing? Answer, total variation metric on probability distributions. Wow, did I say anything about measures? Did I say anything about probability? <laughs> No. So out of the blue, the free algebras, so let me give a short digression on the total variation metric. So the total variation metric is defined this way. P and Q are probability distributions. You look at the soup over all possible measurable sets of the difference between P of E and Q of E. How much can P and Q assign different masses to different sets? You look at the set that maximizes that difference that defines the total variation metric. It's a very handy metric, much used and much loved by people in probability theory. I personally hate it, but that doesn't matter. Uh, I'm going to show you the metric I'll really love later on. <laughs> so it measures the size of the set on which P and Q disagree the most. There's a wonderful duality theorem that tells you that it's also the minimum of something else, as well as being the maximum of this. And I do love duality theorems. So let me explain this duality theorem. So supposing I look at the Borel measures on a metric space with the Borel algebra sigma. Now I have a product space M cross M with the product sigma algebra and Borel measures on this product space. A coupling between P and Q is a probability measure on the product space such that the marginals match P and Q. So this is somehow the probability theory analog of the notion of relation. Couplings are fundamentally important in transport theory and in many, many other things. So we'll write CPQ for the set of couplings for P and Q, okay? So there's not just one thing. In fact, the set of all couplings is itself a convex space. Write delta for the diagonal, just the, the diagonal in M cross M. And here's the total variation duality theorem. The TV metric between P and Q is the minimum of the complement of the diagonal, the minimum of the complement of the measure of the complement of the diagonal over all couplings. 
and in fact, I've written min, not inf. So part of the theorem is saying the min is actually attained. Whereas uh, I did not have a theorem like that. So here's, this is a bona fide duality theorem. Convex combinations of couplings are couplings. And we proved something called a splitting lemma, which don't stare too much at it, but it's a technical lemma that tells you how to break up probability distributions in such a way that you can preserve convex combinations. So we know that there is some freely generated lib algebra from a metric space because of the general theorems we proved about the existence of free algebras. What is it concretely? That's the interesting question here. So let pi sub pi of m be the lib algebra obtained by taking the finitely supported probability measures on m and interpreting this plus sub e as convex combination of finitely supported probability measures. So finitely supported means convex combinations of Dirac measures. So that's some lib algebra. You can actually check all the axioms, okay? Now we have to make it a, a metric space. So we give it the total variation metric to make it a quantitative algebra. And the first theorem we were able to prove is that this thing that you get is an example, not such a shock. The interesting thing is it satisfies that lib axiom. <clears throat> okay, so we use convexity in the splitting lemma to prove the fact that it satisfies all those axioms. But the main theorem is that it is actually the free algebra generated by M. So this set of equations said nothing about probability. It said nothing whatsoever about convexity and so on. And just one, it's the free algebra. It certainly didn't say anything about total variation. But it turns out the free algebra is the space of probability distributions with the total variation metric. So this is giving you an equational handle on these uh, probability metrics. And this is what got me excited because I said, ah, so this is something I, I love and care about, namely metrics between probability distributions. Now I'm giving you new equational ways of reasoning about them. Uh, so it uses the embeddings of convex spaces into vector spaces. And so the axioms give rise to the total variation metric. I'm going to end soon because I see I'm running out of time. But I'd like to now show you the example I, I love, and I'll, I'll do it fast and maybe throw out technical details. So new algebra, same as barycentric algebras, but new axiom. I've thrown out lib, and I've added this one, which says, if I take a pair x, y at distance epsilon 1, I take x prime, y prime with equality sub epsilon 2, and then I take the convex combination with the convex coefficient e, then they will be a distance delta where delta is given by this formula. And maybe this is painful to read. So let's look at the special case where p is one. So, so if p is one, this thing becomes a slightly more readable thing. So you see the same convex combination somehow appears in combining the epsilons. So let me show a picture maybe. So x and x, x and y are a distance epsilon one, x prime and y prime are a distance epsilon two. Then I make a convex combination of x and x prime, convex combination of y and y prime. And that is a distance epsilon prime, which is exactly the same convex combination of epsilon one and epsilon two is kind of a convexity property. And you might say, all right, you throw another random equation at us. What is this? What is it doing? What is the free algebra? And just, um, the answer <laughs> it is the Kantorovich metric. This blew my mind. Because <clears throat> the Kantorovich me metric has a complex definition. So the Kantorovich metric is often incorrectly called the Wasserstein metric. Uh, so I won't go into the history of it because now I've become known as this crazy guy who screams about Wasserstein all the time. <laughs> but but the, the, the W metric, Kantorovich did call it W, which is one of the reasons why people think it's the Wasserstein metric. <laughs> so the, the W metric is defined like this. You take two probability distributions, mu and nu. You look at all the couplings between mu and nu. And then you view this coupling as defining a transport plan that transforms the metric mu into the metric nu. You work out the cost by integrating the metric distance between points with respect to that to that metric, which forms a coupling. And then you take the inf overall coupling. So it's like the minimum cost transport plan that transforms mu into nu. 
And this turns out to be a metric, a very, very, very fundamental metric. Kantorovich actually uh, also defined the metric in another way, which is as a soup between these integrals. So the idea is, how do I observe the difference between f and between mu and nu? Well, what you can observe about measures is their uh, expectation values of observable quantities. So you look at all functions, nice functions, look at the values of these integrals and look at the soup of the difference. So actually you have to restrict f to, the, to be Lipschitz. And the duality theorem says this soup definition is equal to this cost definition. And this duality theorem is super, super useful because it tells you these two definitions are the same. You might wonder why I go on and on about duality theorems. With this inf definition, you can actually prove lower bounds on the metric, sorry, upper bounds on the metric. And with the soup definition, you can prove lower bounds on the metric. And if you cleverly use them both together, you can squeeze the upper and lower bounds and prove an equation that would be super difficult to prove with just one of them. So this is basically what I repeatedly do with duality theorems. Uh, okay, so the, the fundamental fact is that if you take the finitely supported measures on M and interpret it as a barycentric algebra and give it the Kantorovich metric, you actually get one of these algebras satisfying our new equation. Uh, and you use a bunch of technical arguments that don't matter right now, but essentially you can prove that you get the free algebra by finitely supported distributions with the Kantorovich metric. And how about the continuous case? Well, you can actually use weak convergence to show that these finitely supported distributions are actually dense in the space of all Borel measures. So you can actually extend all this to the continuous world. So I, I won't go into details of weak convergence, but essentially for complete separable spaces, if you construct this free algebra in this sense, you will get exactly the Borel measures with the continuous, with the Kantorovich metric. Okay. So I promised you there would be some kind of coming together of logic and analysis. And indeed that happened here in a really strikingly beautiful way in my mind, because there we were, you know, doing 1930s equational logic and suddenly we were doing 1960s <laughs> measure theory and they came together to prove these theorems. So to me, this example is more interesting than the general theory. I mean, some people care about general theory and I'm very happy that we have a general theory, but I'm much happier that we have actually live examples that are not just cooked up toy examples. <clears throat> so the quantitative equations give us a handle on otherwise arcane things like the Kantorovich metrics. And it turns out many other metrics we've also axiomatized, pointed barycentric algebras, Hausdorff metric between compact, uh, uh, compact subsets of a complete metric space and so on can also be axiomatized and proven to arise as free algebras. We've proved, done, done quite a lot of work since then. So this was originally published in 2016. Since then we've proved variety theorems. We've shown how to combine theories and we've given axiomatizations of Markov processes. And just this past year we did fixed point operators and how to do other more exotic combinations of theories. Anyway, I will stop here. Um, let's, let's, I'll give a very warm round of applause to um, uh, Prakash for the great talk. And um, I, I don't know, we could uh, do a few questions now if there's time, Prakash, or... Um, yeah, I have a bit of time. Okay. Um, okay, well, let's uh, open it up to the audience. If there are any questions, uh, feel free should to... I, should I stop sharing? Um, it, maybe there'll be questions about the slides, so uh, if you want to leave. Them. So maybe I can go. So I have a thank you, Prakash, for the, the talk. So I'm, I'm not well versed in that language, a very mathematical oh, cool. language that you use, but I really enjoyed the discussion that was around it and the feeling that you, you convey about it. Um, so I have a long, a high risk, high reward question in some sense. Some I saw two things that I it seems related, and I don't understand how how they would or would not be. And maybe you would, your answer will help me. So is the you mentioned that you have the Lipschitz 
continuous questions on on the on the distance at the end. And I was wondering if this is related to the non-exponential uh, axiom, or I don't know if I say this correctly, but yeah, the non-exponential thing you had. Non-expansiveness axiom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely related to that because the the uh, <clears throat> Lipschitz condition says rather than just saying, well, non-expansiveness is Lipschitz one. So, right, that's what non-expansive means. So yeah. we're considering Lipschitz with other coefficients. And, and you can actually develop the theory, but it's not, and if you, if you want to, so one thing we did was in this work on fixed point operators, you want actually contractiveness. Uh, so we used explicit, information about the Lipschitz coefficients to tell you when fixed points exist. So, so yes, so the general theory of how would you accommodate multiple kinds of Lipschitz things, it does make the theory quite complicated. You have to, doesn't mean it's impossible, it just means it was more complicated than what we had uh, before. And it might be interesting to actually push that, but I'm waiting for more compelling motivation than we should just make it more general. Mm -hmm. If there's some example where really you want those Lipschitz things, that would be you know good motivation to to explore that. Thank you. Maybe I can ask a question. Hi Samuel. Hey Prakash, thanks again for for the talk. I feel like you always talk about what's just in distance, but every time I learn something new, this it's crazy. <laughs> But, uh, and I've studied uh, quite a bit uh, this vast status into myself. So it's always fun to, to see the, all of the different angle that, that this distance can talk, take. So, so let me say so, a bit about this, uh, about the history of this distance. So it was invented in 1942 by Leonid Kantorovich. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in, <clears throat> in the fifties, he investigated along with his student Rubenstein, uh, he proved the duality theorem. So that was 1958, Kantorovich Rubinstein duality. The first time, Wasserstein, so the Wasserstein is a Germanized spelling of the, the original name. So Wasserstein, spelled with a V, is a Russian Jew. Uh, and he wrote a paper that used Kantorovich's distance in a kind of incidental way. It was not, it was not about this distance. And everybody cites this paper without reading it. They say Wasserstein distance site paper by so when was Wasserstein's paper 1969 okay so 27 years later uh, and so one of my postdocs was very keen on understanding the history because we used to call it the Hutchinson metric and then we emailed Hutchinson and he said no 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 I didn't invent it everybody knows about this metric finally we tracked it down and my postdoc emailed Wasserstein who was alive at the time and Wasserstein said yeah well he kind of grudgingly uh, admitted that he didn't invent it. <laughs> I mean, that he knew about it already. I mean, he knew that Kantorovich, had, he, he knows Kantorovich, right? So he, 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 but the reason why it's called the Wasserstein metric is because in the early days of the Soviet Union, you were not just allowed to travel abroad. You had to be like a big shot in the communist party, right? So there was this guy called Dubroshkin, who was the director of the lab where Wasserstein worked. And he had been uh, shown this metric and he thought it was cool. And somebody, he somehow got it into his head by mistake, the idea that Wasserstein invented it. Mm. And then he was the one invited to go to Western countries and he was able to go. And he gave many seminars in the early 60s <clears throat> or, or early 70s. He gave many seminars in Western countries calling it the Wasserstein metric. And that name stuck ever since. Yeah. So, no, I, 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 Okay, the other big mistake was that in Kantorovich's paper, Kantorovich used the notation W mm. <laughs> for this metric. <laughs> yeah. So w, W1 metric is indeed Kantorovich's notation. So if you ever invent a metric, make sure you don't call it P, otherwise everybody will say, oh yes, that's a Panangarden metric. <laughs> <laughs> make sure it's named after your, uh, your, name. your own name. <clears throat> right. Yeah, no, uh, you're you're right. I should start calling it Kantorovich metric, and now I'll, I'll do it. I'll do that now. But then, anyway, my, my my question was, was uh, so one of the things that is very important about the Kantorovich metrics are the some of the their properties, for example, the uniqueness, 
of the of the Cantorovich matrix when p is greater or equal to two. Sorry, what do you mean by uniqueness? The uniqueness of the very centers, right? Or the uniqueness of the the, the geodesic between uh, between uh -huh. two distribution. Yeah, the geometry of the space is super interesting. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I can tell you other great properties. So most important to me is the iso isometric embedding of the underlying space. So if you look at two points, yeah. X and Y, and you look at their Dirac measures, and you look at the Kantorovich distance between the Dirac measures, it's exactly the same as the distance between the original points. Mm -hmm. so the whole original space is isometrically embedded. So if you take two points, and you look at the Dirac measures and you make them come together, the Kantorovich distance goes to zero. If you look at the total variation distance, it stays at one all the time until they suddenly collapse yeah. to zero. So this is yeah. what I don't like about the total variation. It tells you nothing about the geometry of the underlying space. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and to me, it's why the Cantor-Rich uh, distance is so powerful. It's because it's one of the few metrics that, that in which the geometry is uh, consistent. Yeah. But uh, anyway, my, my question is was uh, so given that uh, that these properties, can you can you view these property in your and, and I'm not familiar with, with the category theory and, and all of these. Uh, no, no, this is a beautiful question. I, I, if I understood the question you're asking me, can I give some explanation for things like uniqueness of geodesics and stuff like that? Exactly. My, no, uh, well, thank you for asking me this because I didn't even think of this question, but it's a great one. Short answer is no, I don't know now. Okay. But for sure, this is a worthwhile thing to think about. All right. Just out of curiosity, where are you reading about the geometry of uh, the Kantorovich space? Is it from the Italian book? Uh, so there is two referenced. The first one is the Big Villani book, but it's uh, it's it, it's a bit hard, uh, and you need to read each chapter a bunch of times, and even then you don't fully understand them. So Villani book actually is something I'm more comfortable with, but there's an even more deadly book that we see. <laughs> but uh, maybe if I, I may give a more computational uh, reference. So there's a book from Gabriel Perry. It's a quite recent book called- Gabriel Com Perry, yes. He's an awesome a, guy. Yeah, oh, I've never met him, but uh, he's very pedagogical. He's done a couple of videos too on uh, optimal transport. And uh, I that, feel like his language is, is much more approachable than, than, than some of the others. Uh, yeah, yeah, so Gabriel Perry. So his postdoc is Aude Genevay. Yeah, she, she had a talk a couple of months she ago. She had a talk here, and she's now a postdoc at MIT, and my mm -hmm. former master's student is working in that group now. So I have really? some connections. Oh, nice. So they, they did great things. But the other book I was thinking of mentioning is this one. Yeah, great, exactly. That great and flow, yeah. I was going to mention. This one, uh, I find it quite terrifying. I mean, it makes Vilani looks like a bedtime reading. <laughs> yeah. And this one is actually very good. Who's, who's the authors? Uh, Filippo Sant'Ambrogio. Okay, yeah. yeah. Also Italian. Uh, it's much more readable, but some of the proofs are wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, buggy, buggy, I should say, not wrong. But maybe that'll keep you on your toes. But it, it is, I mean, it's a technically difficult subject, right? You cannot really make it easy. No. No, I, but 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 uh, anyway, the way that I approach this project is more for the applicational point of view and practical uh, utility than uh, the theory side. But uh, sure. I think it's important to 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 have good theory too. So, but anyway, I, I mean, uh, hopefully you you'll be able to answer my question in a couple of years in your talk. Hopefully, Thank we you. can uh, discuss this together sometime. Yeah, I'd love to. All right, thanks. Hopefully one day we can actually meet in front of a whiteboard and... <laughs> I, I, I'd love it. Um, I, I have a question. Sure. Um, sure. If there's time, uh, Prakash, um, or I, uh, two, uh, kind of maybe. Um, so there, I was wondering if you could comment on uh, how this 
your work is related to um, interval arithmetic or affine arithmetic, and um, and and if you have any uh, any ideas about uh, decidability or formalization, uh, thanks. Okay, so those are two different questions. Um, let me answer the second one first. So I had a master's student who tried to uh, not not tried to he he gave some decidability results about proofs in this formalism. Uh, so obviously you can't decide exact equality of, of you know, real numbers, but if you give me some error tolerance, he actually gave some proof on by getting bounds on the size of proof trees. So that was a kind of a proof theoretical presentation and maybe, uh, so then he left, fi finished his masters and left and I would say there's some unfinished results there, but these are really interesting questions that I would like to, uh, address some point and, you know, decidability and complexity questions. It, it, yeah, it seems like the, the epsilon that you have, uh, if that's a, a real field and make you know, able to use RCF to, to do um, some kind of proof there, but uh, or if you have um, maybe like a, a higher uh, or, or order like a probability distribution over that, then I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, real closed fields, eh? So uh, the existential theory of real closed fields is already P space, right? <laughs> so I, it, it, so so it's, um, I, I believe uh, uh, inequalities are um, are uh, decidable. Well, you have uh, decidable, but, but high down. complexity. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not. Um, it's not. It's not like uh, a linear thing. <laughs> no, but uh, yes, I, I don't like to do these things unaided because, uh, you know, complexity theory is highly technical with lots of fiddly counting of, you know, epsilons and stuff, and it's not really to my taste. I'm more an algebra slash topology guy, and I get quite frightened of combinatorics, but I'm a, I'm a good cheerleader for other people doing combinatorics. I, pat them on the back and say, great stuff, guys. Do it some more. But <laughs> personally, don't want to do it myself. Mm. You, you mentioned one of the problems with the fields was um, that, that the zero element. Um, it's not a problem. It's a feature. A fe OK. <laughs> um, it's, a it's an aspect of the theory of fields that they're not equationally definable. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, sometimes, uh, I guess, if you have like a dependent Dependent type, maybe you can keep track of um, the values. And uh, I, I've seen some, mm -hmm. some, you can define a, something over uh, a matrix uh, that gives you something like a field if you keep track of um, the, the values that are, uh, that are occurring. But um, I'm not sure if that's possible in, in, in this setting, but it might be interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah I don't know. Um, and and uh, uh, yeah, so are you familiar with um, in, in other types of arithmetic of, of this sort? I've, oh, I've right. You asked about, sorry, you asked about interval arithmetic. Uh, yeah. So this is not exactly interval arithmetic, but I guess it's related. So interval arithmetic, of course, you squeeze from both ends. Yeah. And, and the way I've seen that discussed is through domain theory, a la Dana, Scott and company. In fact, Interval, in, in, I've done other work on interval interval domains, uh, but that was connected to some research I did in general relativity of all things, which I definitely don't want to talk about today. Uh, and God help us if we start getting a general relativity interest group at Mila, but <laughs> but uh, interval arithmetic uh, shares a particular feature with this theory. And that is, if you start saying, okay, we're gonna keep track of error bounds and we're going to, as our algorithms proceed, we will do some careful error analysis. These bounds tend to grow and very quickly you end up saying, well, uh, we can prove that the probability is between zero and one. And you know, this is not very useful <laughs> in the end when you end up with in that situation. And I, I have a bit of a fear here because if you do a lot of chaining, then those epsilon start adding up. And in the end, you'll be saying, yeah, well, you know, these guys are uh, 
pretty damn far apart. <laughs> and you won't be able to say much. <clears throat> so, so this is one thing. Yes, this is an interesting way of uh, doing quantitative reasoning, but one has to be careful about the price you're paying by chaining lots of things together. So, so would you say you'd say that the uh, the feature that that allows you to um, to prevent that kind of growth uh, in in um, in this quantitative theory is um, it is is some some something about what well, you had this um, condition mm -hmm. over all of the no we don't uh, we're not we're not able uh, to prevent this feature I mean this thing can certainly happen if you if you do it carelessly. <clears throat> and this is the danger of all kinds of quantitative reasoning. You start saying, yeah, I'll keep track of, I don't know, time, time bounds. And then, then you will say, yes, before the end of the universe, this will happen, you know, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Super useful. <clears throat> but, but if it's, it's a disc discrete um, for, for probability distribution, then maybe, um, uh, Maybe you, you 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 would have some some um, what I uh, hope, guarantees about what that. What I hope is that there are few steps which accumulate epsilon and lots of zero steps. The zero steps are free, right? That's ordinary equations. So maybe you manipulate a term a lot, you know, with zero steps, just really restructuring it, and then you do some clever thing with your epsilon a few times. And you get some useful bounds. Um, are, are there any uh, other questions from the audience before we stop the recording? Or um, uh, if 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 not, um, uh, there there's some messages in the chat as well. They seem I think like it's in the chat. I didn't uh, maybe know. I have a bit of an open-ended question, if that's possible, uh, sure. to answer in a short time. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Go yeah, for it. so you, you th first, thank you. It was very fun. Uh, and it was nice to also have an introduction to category theory. So that's something I'll have to read about, I think. Introduction to category theory. Omar, please don't do that without a reason. <laughs> OK, but yeah, it's just, it's just too tempting, you know. <laughs> uh, so I, I wrote some notes on category theory. I don't know if you found these notes. They're on my web page. OK, I'll look for them. Uh, well, my suggestion was don't look for them. <laughs> you, should, <laughs> you should do. You should learn category theory when you have a powerful motivation. Okay, to I'll, I'll in, take that. I'll take that it, suggestion. To read it in an unmotivated way, it'll just come and go. That's that's wise. Okay, um, but anyways, my question was about you. You mentioned the connection to Markov processes and. Uh, mm. As a physicist, that piqued my interest. So can you elaborate a yes. bit on that? So one of the things, so I talked about these theories, right? So we had a theory for just transition systems without probabilities, and we had a theory for probability distributions, right? This, uh, you know, what we called Kantorovich algebras. And we had this, developed this general concept of combining theories. And there's this thing called the disjoint sum of theories. And we showed that if you take the disjoint sum of these two theories, you get the theory of Markov processes, quantitative. Well, Markov change to be precise because it was steps, I should say. Uh, and now the more recent paper is about combining it in a different way called the tensor product of theories where there's now some interaction between the terms. And that way we were able to get MDPs. Wow, okay. And, and so, the, so there, the, it was a case study of, I have a theory of this and I have a theory of that. Can I just put them together and get a combined theory? <clears throat> I see. Well, okay, thanks, interesting. <clears throat>